This episode of Tape Fact is brought to you by The North. Come on down to such amazing places as The Shambles, Tabby Tees, The First Cat Cafe in all of Sheffield, Wakey Pie Shop, The St. Ellen's Glass Blowing Museum, The Humber Bridge, The 11th Longest Bridge of Its Kind in the World, Batley, <laughs> and many more. The North. It's like the South, but not quite as crap. Boron is the first member of the Trials. Sorry, the Tree Elves. Or Trials. Or, er, uh, Tree Elves? Wait, give me a minute here. Boron is the first member of group 13, as in this bit, the 13th column or group of the table's top part. All of the elements in group 13 share a few common characteristics. They all have three electrons in their outermost shells, they're all solids at room temperature, and they're all metals, to an extent. Let me show you what I mean. So, aluminium, gallium, et al are metals, end of. They're shiny, silvery, and readily conduct electricity and heat. But boron is what chemists classify as a metalloid an element whose physical properties lie in between that of a metal and a non-metal. So what are these properties, you ask? Well, it's complicated. Okay, not off to a great start with the whole clarity thing, but bear with me here. In the last few videos, I've started each episode with a little segment on what elements are like in their pure forms. Hydrogen and helium are gases, lithium is a reactive metal, beryllium is highly poisonous and will clog everything you love and cherish full of tumours, yada yada. But boron, ever the chemical prima donna, is an element with several allotropes, which is to say, it can take one of several forms depending on how you purify it. Boron atoms can use the electrons in their outermost shells to bond to each other in a wide variety of weird and wonderful combinations. The number of ways boron atoms can arrange themselves give rise to a veritable zoo of allotropes, all of them pure boron, but each of them markedly different from each other in their physical and chemical properties. One of boron's most common allotropes is amorphous boron, which at standard conditions is a fine chestnut coloured powder. In this form, the boron atoms bond together in the shape of miniature icosahedrons, which is the fancy Greek name for the shape of a 20-sided dice. These icosahedrons are arranged seemingly randomly throughout the powder, and are kept packed together by weak inter molecular forces. The other allotrope is crystalline boron. Oh wait, sorry. Polycrystalline rhombohedral beta boron. Gotta use the full name, don't want any inorganic chemistry lecturers breaking down my door to correct me. Again. In this form, boron is a jet black mineral with a crazy high melting point of 2076 degrees celsius nearly double that of metals like gold and copper. It is also one of the hardest substances known to man, coming in at an impressive 9.5 on the Mohs scale of hardness. While you think these properties and make crystalline boron a highly prized commodity, it's actually kind of rubbish. Despite being relatively inert under standard conditions, crystalline boron is insanely reactive at high temperatures. When exposed to heat, the boron-boron bonds that make up its chemical structure will break apart like cake in the rain, and the boron atoms will form much stronger bonds with other compounds in the system, usually oxygen molecules in the air. Crushingly, you need high temperatures to make crystalline boron in the first place. So better make sure your setup's under vacuum, you know, just to add an extra layer of faff to the proceedings, like a wedding cake tier made out of slugs. I should also stress that crystalline boron is surprisingly brittle. The definition of hardness used in the Mohs scale is a bit different to how most chemists think of hardness, as in how many times you can smack it against your kitchen table. Instead, the definition used by mineralogists is how difficult something's surface is to scratch. So the outside of crystalline boron is incredibly hard, hence it's high ranking on Uncle Mo's family feedback, but if your sample is thin enough, it'll actually be relatively easy to break. So even if you went through all the hassle of purifying it and moulding it into, I don't know, a boron screwdriver, you'd get about three uses out of it before being sent home from woodwork class with very splintery fingers. As chemists developed more of an understanding of boron's chemistry, we learned how to make some pretty weird compounds with it. One such compound is diborane, a colourless, sweet-smelling, incredibly dangerous gas. Diborane is pyrophoric, which means it will ignite spontaneously when exposed to air, usually in a glorious green fireball. The reaction that powers this process, i.e. diborane reacting with oxygen, forms boron trioxide and water. This reaction is so explosively exothermic that diborane was actually considered a potential ingredient in rocket fuel in the 50s. A nice idea in theory, but one that was eventually scrapped due to how difficult diborane was to store and transport. I mean, if you're going to spend several billion dollars on a rocket, it might not be a good idea to stuff the fuel tanks full of something that can be ignited with the cough of a passing butterfly. The the most industrially important boron compound is borax, a white chalky mineral used in everything from soap powder to flame retardants to ant poison, although not at the same time, I'd imagine. Borax is a key ingredient in the production of borosilicate glass, a strong heat resistant material used to make beakers and test tubes for chemistry labs. But as well as being the material of choice for scientists, the big bunch of nerds, borosilicate glass is also used to make household items like casserole dishes and measuring jugs. 
One of the most popular manufacturers of these products is Pyrex, a brand of glassware by the American company Corning International, which was first produced during the First World War. Pyrex has been around in one form or another for over a century, and it was so successful that the word Pyrex has become synonymous with borosilicate glass as a whole. It's like how Googling became a verb for just using a search engine. You didn't have to be using that specific product, but the brand name had become so ingrained in the cultural memory that people just assumed that you were. But unlike Google, a company that currently has the search engine market crushed in its grip like a mouse in a sandwich press, a lot of Pyrex kitchenware isn't even made of borosilicate glass anymore. In the 1990s, the American branch of Pyrex switched from borosilicate glass to sodaline glass, which is used to make household windows and old-fashioned milk bottles. Now, sodaline glass is far cheaper to make than borosilicate, but this comes with several drawbacks. For one, it's much easier to scratch, so kitchenware made from sodaline glass will lose its factory fresh look much quicker than its borosilicate counterpart. And more importantly, sodaline was much less resistant to heat shock, which is when a material goes from one extreme in temperature to the other. Now, we all like a good urban legend, and stories of exploding Pyrex dishes have been knocking around the web for decades. In preparation for this video, I spent hours wading through the bubbling mire of lies that is the internet, painstakingly plucking out nuggets of truth like nits from a schoolboy's head. While soda lime glass will break after repeated exposure to heat shock, it'll very rarely explode. It'll more just kind of disappointingly crack down the middle. The change to soda lime glass was almost certainly a cost saving manoeuvre, but that didn't stop people's imaginations from running wild with the story. One rumour I was able to firmly put to bed is that the quality drop was down to new glassware being made in China. I guess the enormous header on the Pyrex homepage saying made in the USA wasn't enough for some people. Another one I was able to dispel is that Pyrex deliberately made their kitchenware less resistant to heat shock to combat the crack cocaine epidemic of the 1980s. Many recipes for crack cocaine rely on a process known as sintering, which is what happens when powder clumps together to form pebble-like grains of solid material. One way to do this is to intensely heat your reaction vessel before bringing it swiftly back down to room temperature. And no, put your hand down, I'm not teaching anyone how to make crack. I'm not that desperate for clicks. Well, not yet anyway, give me a few months. Drug dealers often use kitchenware to furnish out their chemistry labs, and if rumours are to be believed, Pyrex purposely lowered the heat tolerance of their products to prevent them from being misused in this way. I mean, the rumours are completely baseless and have no proof, but I heard this one from an actual chemist. I mean, I was an undergrad, so I was probably on about four hours of sleep and eight pints of carling, but it still counts. In conclusion, the products of boron chemistry will doubtless enrapture the hearts of lasagna lovers and crack dealers for generations to come. Also, not to throw shade at my Yankee friends, but I should point out the last third of this video only applies to American Pyrex. European Pyrex is still made from borosilicate, which means like our chocolate, our beer and our non-squirtified cheese, the European version of Pyrex is vastly superior to its transatlantic counterpart. Don't feel too bad though, America. You guys are some good things. Seasons 2 through 8 of The Simpsons are pretty solid, eh? And the moon landing, that was pretty cool. Got some nice snipes out of that one. What about tea? Americans like tea, I can appreciate that one. Look, you guys even have a whole political movement named after it, and... Wait, what's this stuff about? You guys dumped what in a harbour?